When the Buddha formulated his first noble truth, the truth of suffering and stress, he didn't say something useless like, life is suffering. He didn't say something vague and obvious like, there is suffering. He said something more specific, useful, and insightful. Suffering is the five clingy aggregates. And as he pointed out elsewhere, the problem isn't with the aggregates of form, feeling, perceptions, fabrication of consciousness. The problem is with the clinging. So suffering is clinging. When he said that what he taught, or all he taught, was suffering and the end of suffering, he was basically saying all he taught was clinging and the end of clinging. When we practice, this presents a challenge, because he's basically telling us we're suffering because of our attachments. The firmer our attachments, the more strongly we hold to them, the more we have to let go of them, because they're causing us the most suffering. This is why that first noble truth is a noble truth. The simple act of suffering is not noble. And if we were to blame our suffering on other people or things outside, that would not be noble. It's noble when we realize we have to sacrifice things that we hold too dearly. But as the Buddha said, it's not total sacrifice. Every time the Buddha recommends a sacrifice, it's a trade-up. As he said, when you let go of things that are not really yourself, it's going to be for your long-term welfare and happiness. He was talking to a group of monks one time, and he said, you see these leaves and twigs and branches? If someone started burning them, would you say you are being burned by that person? That person is burning you? And the monk said, no, because those twigs and leaves and branches are not us or ours. In the same way, the Buddha said, what is not really yours, let go of it. It will be for your long-term welfare and happiness. So it's not totally negating you. He's just pointing out that there are things that you're holding on to that are not really yours. A lot of things we hold on to are not just things. We hold on to our skills. We hold on to our way of acting in the world. This is related to our sense of what the world is and what should be done and what things are worth wanting. This is why the Buddha said there are four types of clinging, not just one. We don't just cling to ourselves, but we cling to our views about how the world works, how it's structured, what should be done within that world to find the pleasures that we want, most usually sensual pleasures. But here's the Buddha is asking you to aim at something higher. And here again, this is why these truths are noble. You aim at something higher than sensuality. Because sensual pleasures come and they go. And often when they go, you're left with the karma that you did to gain them, along with the disappointment that they're now gone. The same with status, praise of other people. He says, is this really worthwhile? So much of what we do is for sensual pleasures, status, praise, wealth, the things of the world. But they all disappoint. So you have to look at the aspects of yourself that you developed in order to develop these things. Are they going to be useful on the path? The Buddha wants you to aim for something higher, which is going to require a different set of skills. And some of your old skills may have to die, because they're actually getting in the way of the practice. The things that we do to get ahead in the world will not necessarily help us get ahead in the drama. Sometimes they're at immediate cross-purposes. 
as we call into question where we're aiming in life, it begins to call into question a lot of the things we've been doing, a lot of the things we identify with as ourself. Our old strategies for finding happiness, we suddenly find, are leading more to pain. And some people resist. They say, well, this is who I am. But they're like the people who can't adjust, say, when they go to a new culture or when their own society undergoes radical change. They're beginning to see this all around us. Life is different now. And when people keep talking about returning to normal, you wonder what that new normal will be and what new people they will have to become in order to negotiate that skillfully. It's even more so as you encounter the, this change of culture coming into the culture of the noble ones, where things that are valued in the world are not valued here. Some of them are. It's not like you're totally having to abandon your old skills. It's just learning how to convert your old skills to a new purpose. But there are some old skills and some ways of acting that are simply no longer appropriate. And because the way we act creates our sense of what we are. That means a lot of the things that we think are actually part of us, of our very being, are going to have to be left behind. And again, some people resist. Like the people who say that now that Buddhism has come West, we have to adopt a Western worldview, Western values. That's missing the whole point. The Buddha formulated a worldview that is specifically designed for putting an end to suffering, regardless of your cultural background. Even for people in ancient India, it was quite a shift. So there's a lot we have to let go. After all, we're here for the end of clinging. Not just because we think clinging is a bad idea, but because we realize, as the Buddha said, the suffering lies in the clinging. If you don't want to suffer, you have to learn how to let go. Let go skillfully. You hold on to the path while you're doing it. But there are many things that, with which you identify yourself that you'll have to let go. But there is compensation. A different you develops around your ability to, to meditate, around your ability to observe the precepts, around your ability to take joy in generosity. It's one of the reasons why these meritorious activities are an important part of the path. They create a healthy you. and help you realize how much your self-esteem, your self-worth, should depend on doing things that really are beneficial for yourself and for others. Things that are harmless, ways of finding happiness that are harmless. Because that you is much more secure than the old you that had to claw its way through the world. So remember, we are in a noble path. These noble truths about suffering and the cause of suffering, those two things are not noble in themselves. But when you view them from the right perspective, and you follow the duties that are appropriate for those truths, in other words, comprehending the suffering and abandoning the craving, then those truths become noble. You become noble. And you progress on the noble path. 